Hello, I'm Lizelle Sambri, and welcome back to my channel where I talk about all things writing, traditional publishing, and a little bit of reading. And today we are going over how I create content to promote my books and how I kind of pull that all together. Uh, I have a previous video that I did on that this channel that I will link down below where I talked more generally about how I plan my marketing. Um, I discussed pre-order campaigns a little bit um, and marketing plans a little bit and just kind of did more of a general overview. Whereas this video is quite a bit more specific. Um, so I'm using the release of my newest novel, Tender Beast, which is a YA psychological thriller slash horror. I'm using that as kind of a case study for this video so I can give more detailed information about how exactly I planned out my promotional campaign, the different steps I took, how I organized things more in detail, and I will have examples from all of the content that I created for that campaign to show you along the way so you can get a more kind of specific idea about how I put together a social media campaign to promote my book. And I want to say this up front that no author needs to be doing all of this. This is not a need to, but I know sometimes people are interested in these sorts of things or they kind of are in traditional publishing. They want to start promoting their book. They don't really know where to start or what to do. And so I thought this might be helpful in terms of kind of pulling everything together that I have done to promote my book and uh, basically presenting it to you so that you can kind of get an example idea of how that might go over. Um, um, and so I will be talking about how I create a content calendar. I will be talking about the specific sorts of pieces of content that I picked and why I decided to do that, how I kind of put those things together. And I'll also be talking about how I decide what kind of like worked or didn't work after the fact. Um, so that is what this video will be all together. And I will also say before we get started that if you are wanting to hear from my perspective about marketing, but also from the perspective of an indie author, um, the wonderful Becca C. Smith, who is a wonderful friend of mine as well. We both did a live stream on Brit Writerly's channel that I will also link down below where we have a discussion. Um, and so I really, traditional publishing is my realm, but if you want to kind of hear like an indie author perspective, um, which is very different and really interesting, um, I would recommend checking out that video as well. But as usual, there are timestamps. So if you want to jump around, you are welcome to. And let's go ahead and get started. Let's begin with talking about the content calendar. This is going to be a big part of the video because the content calendar to me is a big part of the planning and executing of a campaign. Um, and I will stop first and say when I'm talking about I'm saying a word like campaign, it's because I worked in social media marketing and these are the ways we talked about things. But to me, um, when I am making a plan for a specific period of time to promote a specific book, I call that a campaign because it is planned out. Um, there is some sort of strategy behind it. I am pre putting together content. And to me, that's why I describe it as a campaign as opposed to my regular social media behavior where I just kind of post things truly whenever I want, whenever something comes up, which to me is very different. And so a content calendar is to me, necessary for putting together a campaign because it is what it sounds like. You create a calendar and then you plan out exactly when you are going to post different things, um, what it is going to look like, um, what the copy, um, aka the description is going to be, everything that you are going to put out in that certain period of time so that you know exactly what is going to be happening. Um, and in that way, I will say that you should only put things in the content calendar that you can guarantee um, so you might be, for example, hoping to get trade reviews, but I wouldn't put in a space for if I get a trade review, you want to put in things that you know absolutely that you can get the content for and you can post. The first step in putting together the content calendar is to decide what you want to make. Um, what sort of promotional material do you want to put out? Do you want to do just photos? Um, do you want to do photos and videos? Are you planning to have your face in them? Are you planning to just kind of use props and that sort of thing? Basically kind of brainstorming, if you will, what you actually want to make. Um, and when you are thinking of these things, I would say to really only do stuff that you actually want to do um, because if you don't want to do it, it's not going to get done or it's going to be very difficult to get done. Um, and so 
to me, I would say it is better to do things that you actually want to do um, than to be shoving yourself into doing things that you know you're not going to enjoy. Um, I will also say to kind of like keep things like realistic and within a doable scope. Um, so there might be something really huge that you want to do, but you're not sure yet. Um, I would say maybe scale down a little bit in the beginning um, until you're comfortable doing this sort of thing. And then you can kind of create bigger plans or ideas um, or go gung ho. I'm not the boss of you, um, but these are just the things I kind of recommend. And so that's what I would say as the first step is to just kind of decide roughly what you would like to do. And to me, the next step after that is to figure out how much of that content, how much do you want to post each week um, and how much content, like what sorts of things do you want in that week? And also, how long do you want this camping to run? Um, for me, after promoting my books, um, Tender Beasts is the fifth book. Well, really, I'd say fourth book because my original IP is what I've kind of put together and like actively tried to promote more um, as opposed to uh, the He-Man IP book um, I was a little bit more hands-off with. <laughs> um, so I would say I've, I've done like four books worth of promotion and at this point in time I find that like a month before two months before for me personally is a very good sweet spot um i just find that if i try to plan a campaign super far in advance i'm going to burn out by the time i get to the actual release and i find that people pay the most attention to your book and what you are doing the closest time to release and so to me that promotion one to two months before is quite a bit of time. I used to do three months. It was, I found it, found it was too far out um, and that it was better to do it closer to time. I also think, especially if you were going to be pushing for people to pre-order, I feel like people are more comfortable pre-ordering when the date is closer than when you're kind of asking people to pre-order something like six months out, which I still do, but I'm like, okay, I don't expect you to do that. <laughs> I expect that to be like really big, like, uh, readers who really enjoy my writing or what have you. Um, and so I find that like two months before, even a month before is a really good time period. But again, it's up to you to decide that for yourself. Um, and at that point, decide how many posts you want to be going out a week. Um, so I will usually do two, maybe three. Um, I like to start with two. Um, and then if something, you know, unexpected might come up, then I kind of have space to throw in three. Sometimes I just throw in three because I have an idea. It really all depends. Um, but just kind of start with a baseline amount. Um, so say you want to do two posts a week, um, and this is where I'll try and kind of mix it up based on um, different types of content. So if I'm going to do two posts a week, I'll do one that's a photo and one that's a video, and I'll alternate and do that back and forth for the different weeks. And so that's basically kind of what you're deciding, like how much content do you want to put out of what kind and kind of putting that in. And so what I would do is I would put that in your content calendar just as placeholders. Um, so you can, what I will literally do is I will put a post in Notion. Um, I create my content calendars now in Notion. Previously, I've done um, Google Calendar, but I just prefer to do it in Notion. It's really up to you. You can literally just do a paper calendar in your uh, journal or scrapbook or whatever it is if that's the medium that you prefer to use it's really up to you how you want to create these calendars I just prefer digital because I'm that sort of person um, and so I do these in notion and I just create a little card for each of the placeholders and so I'll just put like photo post video post, photo post, video post, and I literally just plug those in. Um, if you have specific ideas for content you want to make, this is a great time to plug those in as well. So for example, um, if I know that I want a post to be like a quote or something, I'll put that in at that point. Um, but I don't want to get too ahead of ourselves. It's basically just like if you already had an idea of something you wanted to post and you're making placeholders, that's a time where you can just put it into a placeholder slot. 
Some other placeholders that you can put in is if your publisher has promised to create for you certain assets, um, that is pieces of content, things like quote graphics or an animated cover, you can also put in placeholders for what they're providing. Um, in this case, I would, if you have like a good general idea of when they usually get those things to you, then you can kind of de decide timing yourself. Um, but it might also be worth it to kind of send a message to your editor and be like, hey, I saw in my marketing plan, you all are going to create these um, graphics for me. Do you know when I might get those so that I can kind of figure out when I have things to post, that sort of thing, um, just so that you can figure out that sort of planning. Um, however, if you feel like that your publisher is not yet fully, um, if you're not 100% sh sure you can rely on them providing that, um, then you can not include that in your plan. And then if they come through, you can add that as an additional post and just kind of plan without them. It'll really kind of depend on your relationship with your publisher and how they follow through on things. Another placeholder that you can do is um, this year I did a pre-order campaign for Tender Beasts, and so I put in placeholders for when I was going to announce the pre-order campaign and like some touch points to remind people about the pre-order campaign, which I'll talk a little bit more in my pre-order campaign <laughs> section. Um, but that was a placeholder that I put in as well, just so I would have that. And once you have in all your placeholders, the next step is to start filling them in. So what exactly are you going to put in your content calendar? How many details do you want? For me, I always want to put in as many details as possible. So when I have my little cards in Notion, the sort of things that I put in there is, okay, what is the content going to be? So I have a photo placeholder. So what sort of photo am I going to do? Am I going to take a photo of my book? Um, am I going to make some sort of graphic instead? Um, what exactly is that going to be? And so you're deciding specifically what the content is going to be. Um, I will also put in like brainstorming plans for what it could look like and what I might do. Um, so I did a photo that I took of uh, my arc of Tender Beasts um, and the uniform that I had put together to cosplay my main character. Um, and so I was like, I'm going to do a photo with the book and the uniform. And so when I was in planning stages, all I wrote was photo with book and uniform because I knew I was going to do the whole cosplay thing from that point. And that was how much detail I had. And over time, I built up this information. And so as I had more details I would decide you know this is the date when I want to take my photos that sort of thing um, and also this is what I want to write for the copy for the description that'll go on Instagram because that's where I'm going to post this and this is everything I want to say um, yeah and sometimes I do additional brainstorming there sometimes I plan things out um, but essentially I use the content calendar for all stages of creating that piece of content from originally putting in my kind of scrap out of an idea of like this is kind of what I want to do to uh, these are the specific details to okay I have the photo ready to go and now I can kind of check box this checks check box oh my god check boxes <laughs> or tick it off. That's easier to say. Um, and so your content calendar can really be something that you build on over time. You don't kind of have to have everything done at one point. I certainly don't. I usually start with like a skeleton ideas that I've kind of put in. Um, and then I start to plan, okay, where, when am I going to film this? Um, when am I going to make this if it's a graphic um, and not something that I'm going to film? Um, so essentially at this point, you're kind of just building up and deciding. And so again, you don't have to do all of this at once, but this is like a big benefit of the content calendar is that is a tool that you can use for both brainstorming, for planning, and for kind of finalizing your content and helping you execute it, which I find to be really helpful. My next step in the content calendar process is to now start to plan out when I'm going to create all of this. So at this point in the content calendar, I have at least a rough idea of all the different things I want to create and all the different dates when I want to post things. And so now I want to start to plan to create all of those things before that period of time. Um, because how I set things up is that I want to pre-create 
everything that I've planned out in this calendar. And so that means that, you know, this two month chunk when I'm going to post everything, I want to have created that at least like, you know, I want to work on creating that like the month before or even farther than that before all of this stuff is going to come out. Um, because it saves you a lot of time and effort, um, and especially if you are putting out launching a book, um, it also reduces the amount of work that you have to do during your launch time, which may become very busy, uh, and it may be difficult for you to then put out all of that content that you've planned. And so planning ahead, getting all of those things ready ahead of time can be really helpful. Um, and this doesn't mean that you like can't post things on the fly because you absolutely still can, and you just slot it into an open space. Um, but having all this planned ahead of time means that you don't have to scramble during that period before when you want to promote your book. You already have all of this stuff ready. Um, so I will plan when I'm going to put all these things together. And so for me, the most helpful way to do this is to start chunking things together. Um, so for example, if you planned a bunch of photo posts that require that you take a picture of your book, I will chunk all of those pieces of content together and say, I'm going to do all of that on one day. And so you set up to take photos of all your stuff and do it the same day so that you're done. And then if I need videos where I'm going to take videos where my face is going to be in it, I will plan all the videos where my face is going to be in it to film on one day. And so I get made up for one day. <laughs> I do them all at once. Um, and you can wear, I will talk about this more in my video section, but people will not care that you are wearing the same outfit if they even notice, which they may not. Um, but that's what I mean. I just kind of put together those sorts of things and then you can work on them kind of all at one time, um, which I find saves time and effort. Um, and it also in the terms of like, if you're making graphics, that sort of thing can also help you make things a little bit more cohesive because you're working on it all at one time. And then you don't have to be like, what font was I using? What background was I using? What thing was I using? Because you just did it all on one day. Um, and so that's how I would plan that. And then to me, I, in that same content calendar using Notion, I will set prep dates um, and I will put them in different kind of sections. I'll use the calendar to be like, okay, on this prep day, I'm going to film all of this stuff. Um, and I will make little checklists and things for myself. Like, what do I need? What props do I have to get? What do I have to organize to get this done for this particular day? And so to me, that's the next big step of creating that content calendar is really deciding when you're going to do all of this stuff. And so now what we are going to get into the next section is the actual kind of more nitty gritty of deciding the specific content and putting together and how you can create these things. So filming content, what is this process like? So for me, for Tender Beast, I did a few different types of videos and photos that required me to actually like take physical videos and photos. Um, so uh, there were two kind of types of these. So there were videos um, where my face was going to be in it. There were videos where it was just going to be my book. Um, and so I did kind kind of chunk those into different sections, different days. Um, but when I was going to do videos of myself speaking, I did try and put together a little script. Um, you don't have to be exact to the script. You don't have to read off of anything, but I find that knowing ahead what you are going to say can be really helpful especially in helping you kind of not waste time on the day when you have to do things. Um, for me, I know I try to film in a specific period of time when my partner is like sleeping or away um, because I get self-conscious about <laughs> filming. Um, but you may have, you know, children, other obligations, that sort of thing. Um, and so when you get down to the filming, to me, planning as much as possible ahead of time is really helpful in terms of just kind of getting down to business once you've decided to do that. So I find a little script is helpful. Um, I don't often go to it verbatim unless I'm saying like uh, quotes from my book, um, but it's just helpful to have something kind of prepared. Um, 
and I always kind of film in a similar sort of space. Um, in the case I did some cosplay videos which I did film in front of a green screen so that was a very different sort of setup. Of course you do not need to go that ham, it's just something that I wanted to do and so I decided to do that in that way. Um, you can film with a camera if you have a camera, you can use your phone. Um, many people's phones film in just as good quality, um, especially for posting on social media, it is totally fine. Um, so at that point that's what I decided to do. Um, also kind of know what orientation you are going to be filming in. Um, so for me personally, if I'm going to be posting something and I know it is going to be a TikTok video or an Instagram reel, I will film vertically. So I have a camera and I will turn my camera to the side and I will film it that way. Some people will say to film uh, horizontally in 4k and then you can kind of cut it down. I feel like that is very complicated for the average person and even complicated for me who like does video things and so I will just film in the exact orientation that I want to post it. It just makes it easier that way. And for me, I do recommend that if you're going to post to TikTok, you're going to post um, to Instagram Reels to shoot it in vertical. Um, I don't recommend posting a horizontal video. Um, it's just kind of you want to match what works for the platform. And yes, you can post a horizontal video, but they want you to post a vertical video. So I would recommend filming in that way. Um, when you're taking photos with your camera, it's a little bit different. I do try and make sure that how I'm placing the book, that I have a good amount of space above and below the book, um, because I will probably want to cut the photo to be a little bit vertical sized. Um, and so these are kind of the things that you might think about just to give yourself a lot of different options. So if you take all your pictures really close to your book, you could only use pictures really close to your book. But if you take a bunch of them far away, you can kind of zoom in or out. Um, and what I recommend is to take as when you're taking photos, take as many photos as possible. So you have lots to choose from, um, do as much variety as you can. Uh, in terms of props, you can use all sorts of things. Um, I will go to HomeSense literally and I'll just like pick out little things from HomeSense that I think will look nice with the book. Um, getting a sort of like blanket that I can set it down on so that it's not clear that I'm taking a bunch of pictures on my desk. Um, but you can do whatever you want with this. Again, this will be really based on what you have planned out in your calendar as what you want to do. Um, but that's basically kind of my tips that I would say for filming content. Now I'm going to talk about creating graphics. Uh, so to me, the difference between like a photo and a graphic is a photo is something that you are actually going to take with a camera in the real physical world. And a graphic is something that you create entirely online or entirely within a program. Um, it doesn't require you to take any pictures. You're just going to manipulate existing pictures. Um, sometimes you might incorporate pictures and put them into a graphic. Um, but if it's mostly you editing something on an app or Photoshop or what have you, that's what I would consider a graphic. Um, so you might have graphic posts you want to post or sometimes things that are kind of just online like a lot of authors will post the title page of their book um, and to me that just means taking your past pages and kind of taking a photo of your title page or taking a screenshot rather um, and I would also call that a graphic because it's still purely digital. Um, so that's what I mean when I'm talking about graphics just so that you know. Um, and so for me I create graphics using different types of software. Um, I have access to Adobe Express because I use Adobe programs, um, but Adobe Express is basically Canva and Canva is free or you can have paid versions of Canva. I know lots of authors already have some sort of Canva access or expertise. I've used this in the past as well, even honestly, professionally, um, I've been, I've used Canva, so it is very good. Um, and it's a very good program. It's just now for my personal preference, I use Adobe Express or sometimes I use Photoshop because it's just kind of easier to do something that way um, or easier to make something cohesive. But to me, the first step in this process um, for traditionally published authors is to get the cover file from your publisher. 
So I would ask them for a layered version of your cover file. And essentially this is kind of, I guess, like a, I don't know, a publishing jargon way of just asking for the Photoshop file, <laughs> for asking for the design file. If your publisher for some reason won't give that to you, um, then I would ask them for um, a high quality version of the cover file. I would ask if they can isolate out the title font of your um, cover so that you can have that. Um, and if you've got any like characters on the page, if they can isolate that for you. Um, and if they can give you the font that is being used on your book, um, because those are kind of the big things that you'll want access to in order to create graphics. And sometimes these fonts are like paid version of font paid versions of fonts that you can't necessarily just like go online and find. Um, and so that's why I say to ask them for the font file, because then you can get it from them for freezies and you can use it yourself. Um, but ideally you would get kind of a layered version of it. So for me, when I ask my publisher for that, they send me the Photoshop design file. Um, they also send me all of the fonts, um, which I really appreciate and is very, very helpful because then you have that kind of all together in one package. Um, and the design file will also have like the full wrap. Um, if you are a person and you don't have access to Photoshop, um, then, in that case, I would also ask your publisher if they can pull out those elements for you or find a friend who can do it for you. I have done that for friends before. Um, and why I say this is because your cover is like your main piece of marketing. And so if you are going to be making little graphics and things, being able to pull out elements from your cover that people can recognize readily if they've seen your cover before or they can link to your cover is really helpful when you're creating those graphics. I also find personally it creates more cohesion between the different things that you are making, which I find to be really helpful. Maybe it's just like marketing brain, um, but to me, it's part of kind of the branding of the book. Like the cover is that main piece of branding for the book. And when all of your graphics kind of look like your cover, um, I find that it strengthens the brand and it strengthens the touch points because people have to see your cover a few times for it to kind of lock into their brain. And to me, when I'm creating graphics that kind of look like my cover, I'm helping lock that into people's brains, which may be complete mumbo jumbo and have no basis to it in any way and might not matter. Um, but I like to do it and I also just think it looks nicer when all of your stuff kind of matches. Um, and so that can be really helpful. I also find it helpful to create a sort of template for graphics. Um, so, you know, if I want to if I get like a trade review and I want to post that, or I am like on a top 10 list or something and I want to post a graphic about that, having kind of a graphic ready to go that's like, you know, a nice background that matches my cover and my little graphic of my book um, and whatever text I want to put on it, having like a little template of that that I can just pull and throw out and having kind of two to three variations so I can mix it up a little bit. I find that to be really helpful too, just in case something kind of comes up randomly. Um, but that is kind of how I figure things that I wanna do for the graphics and things that I find are really helpful to have up front in order for you to be able to do that. Um, and the same with the filming content, when I'm making graphics, I will chunk this into a specific day, which again, helps with just like focusing in. So, okay, for these two, three hours, I'm just gonna make graphics and then I can kind of make sure I'm doing everything together, matching my fonts, that sort of thing. Um, and so that's what I would keep in mind for when you are making these things. Um, if you don't know where to start for a graphic, you're like, I don't even know what to put on this thing. Um, I find it really helpful to use templates. So Canva will have a bunch of templates that you can kind of make your own. Adobe Access also, Adobe Express rather, also has templates. Um, you can also just like look on Pinterest and like look at the other graphics that other people make and get an idea. Um, if you're really stumped, there all there also are cases where you can like go on Etsy and you can buy like a package of graphics um, that someone has put together and then just kind of customize them to make them your own, change the font and change the background to something that matches your book. Um, 
Something that I also, I forgot to mention this earlier, but something that is also helpful is to try and get a mock-up if you can of your book. Um, and so your publisher might already have this and just be able to give it to you. But a mock-up is essentially like your book as it will look digitally like a real book. And so this can also be helpful for graphics. Um, I personally, I just buy mock-up whatever's and I just make my own mock-up because I'm like that um, but you can ask your publisher because chances are your publisher is using that in promotion in some way and so they might just have that to just like give to you and so you can use that as well um, or you can just use the flat cover image it's really up to you I just think sometimes a mock-up looks cute so that's something else that you can ask for um, and that is kind of basically I think everything I have to say about kind of putting together graphics. Now let's talk about editing your content. So you've taken all of your photos and all of your videos and now you want to kind of finalize them. Um, so I'll talk about photos first. This is really dependent on your personal preference. Um, you might have just like taken your photo and you think that's you're happy with it and you're just gonna post that straight and there's nothing wrong with that you can absolutely do that um, for me personally I do like to put a filter on my photos I know that sometimes there used to be a lot of contention about whether or not to use a filter um, but I like to put a filter on my photos I also like to edit the photos um, so I use Adobe Lightroom for this um, just because I'm already using the Adobe suite of products and so I'll just go ahead and use it but there are a lot of different like photo editors out there there are also some free ones there's also some tools like within Instagram itself that you can also use um, and so I use Lightroom because what I will do is I will go on Etsy and I will find a like set of presets from someone um, Adobe Lightroom presets on Etsy and I'll buy them and it's usually like five dollars something like that um, and then I can use that on all of my photos. And I like to do this because it creates a sort of cohesion to the photos. Um, so even if the photos are all different, I can kind of use a similar filter on all of them and then they kind of feel a little bit more like a collection. Um, and that's just personal preference. Again, you don't have to do that. You don't have to use filters. You can just take your photo and post it. Um, but sometimes I will also make edits um, because I wanna make the cover look a little bit more vibrant than it did when I took the photo. Um, this is also a place to like fix little mistakes if you like took your photos and you didn't and you thought they looked good but then you saw them and you were like oh no I actually don't like this um, I also use this time to resize the photos so because I take the photos with my camera um, they're often horizontal and so I will kind of crop them to be um, a different size for Instagram and so I kind of use a little bit more of a vertical size I believe it's 1350 by 1080 um, if you want to be really specific <laughs> about it um, uh, but I crop it that way because those photos take up more real estate on Instagram when people are scrolling. Um, those longer format, more vertical photos just take up more space and so people are more likely to stop and look at it. Um, and so that's why I would do it that way. Um, sometimes I do squares, sometimes I do that. It really is just dependent. Um, but that's what I'm going to say about editing photo photos. Editing videos. So this you will probably need to do even if it's very small because usually when you take a video of yourself you start the camera and you well maybe this is a millennial pause thing so maybe I shouldn't ascribe that to everyone but for a lot of us you might start the video you pause a little bit then you start speaking um, and then when you finish you might pause a little bit again you like go to click off the camera and those things you obviously don't want in your video so you have to do some amount of editing even if that's just kind of cutting the beginning and cutting the end um, and so those are really videos where you're kind of just talking um, or you are yeah you might just like be taking a little video of your book um, you can do more kind of in-depth editing of your video and that's really dependent on each person um, so for example I will do things like I made a little book trailer and so for that I needed things like stock photo so it wasn't just a video of my face my face was in the beginning but then I needed stock video and stock photos um, I will use there are free websites like Pexels um, which I will link all this down below Pexels um, and Unsplash have a lot of 
you know, royalty free photos that you are allowed to use. Um, Pexos also has a lot of great videos that I will use. Sometimes I will use a paid service. So Envato Elements is usually what I will use in that case. And I'll get stock photos and videos from them. Um, I know sometimes people just kind of like pull images from Pinterest. I don't do that personally. I feel like it's just ingrained in me to use royalty free photos and stuff on Pinterest. I'm like, I don't have permission from anyone to use that. And so I don't use those in my photo or video posts, that sort of thing. Um, that's me personally. Again, some people just do it anyway. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people just do it anyway. But for me, I work to just use royalty free stuff, commercial, whatever you're allowed to use. Um, so that's why I use those websites and I will pull things from there to put together into the video. Um, for me, something that I did kind of brand new for this Tender Beast campaign is I created a sort of end cap, if you will. Um, so I had an end sort of section that I tacked on to pretty much all of my videos, um, which basically was like a little tagline um, and the date that Tender Beast was going to be coming out um, and like the title card of Tender Bees with like a little bear claw scrape through it. Um, I would probably in the future and I probably recommend to people to throw up your book cover in there too because people will recognize your book cover most often and so if you have that in there people can be like oh this was about x book um, and I find this was helpful just to put at the end because it just gives extra information to people like sometimes people might find your stuff completely out of context um, and I just find it's helpful to put that sort of thing right at the end. Um, so that was something I created and then I tacked on to most of my videos and I put that right at the end there so that people could always be reminded, hey, this is about this book. Um, but yeah, and so I edit in uh, Adobe Premiere Pro again because I have access to the Adobe suite of products, but a program that I have used in the past and still use and find really helpful is CapCut. Um, it is a free program and you can edit your videos right on your phone. Um, and so I find that to be really helpful as well. There's all different fonts. You can actually like for free, still within the free program, you can add your own fonts. Um, so you can very easily kind of add the fonts that you got from your publisher that match your book. And then you can also have kind of the fonts in your video, matching your book, matching your graphics, all of those sorts of things, which I like because again, creates cohesion um, and a sort of like branding to the campaign. Again, you don't need to do, but I am just like that. So I do those things in that way. Um, and then in terms of music, um, it's really helpful if you're doing Instagram reels or TikTok sort of videos, because those already have music on them. So you can use the music that's on there. Um, sometimes if I'm creating something like a trailer, I will just kind of sign up for Envato Elements, or I will find somewhere to like get a free royalty free song or like um, to just pay for it. Um, and I do this because TikTok and Instagram <laughs> sometimes will just take off songs. Um, and so it kind of sucks when you like take the time to like put a video together and like time it to a song and then they just take the song down. And then if anyone looks back on the video later, it's just like it has no sound to it. Um, and so in those cases, I've found now that I like to just use the kind of um, royalty free whatever music um, or pay for a little clip of music and use that instead, because then at least I know that that's not going to take be taken down or taken off. So it's really up to you dependent. Um, if you don't think it's that big of a deal, then that is totally fine. Um, and that's pretty much kind of everything about the actual kind of editing of the video itself. Um, I also personally will add subtitles on. Um, you can like Instagram. I'm not sure about the Instagram subtitles, but I know on TikTok for sure they have kind of an auto caption feature. I prefer to do the captions myself so that I can edit them myself um, and so that I can make sure they're correct and I can see them on the video. It also makes it easier because if I'm going to take a video and post it on both TikTok and Instagram, then I can just take the same video. I don't have to worry about their different kind of subtitling <laughs> softwares. Um, and for that, I use an online program called Capwing. 
Um, I use that just because I'm already using it to subtitle my YouTube videos and so it's just natural for me to continue to use it. It also lets you use your own fonts and colors and it has a really strong auto captioning feature. Um, CapCut also has the auto captioning feature in it which I also find to be very good and you can do the same thing with your own font what have you um, and I like to put those things on just ahead of time um, and then you always have it there and then it's accessible for people who need it and it's also really helpful because sometimes people just like haven't put the sound on and then they can still see what you're saying so um, that's why I would really recommend just kind of captioning or subtitling your videos writing copy so this is the description essentially of the post so if you are posting on instagram or twitter or I'm sorry x i guess or tiktok or what have you <laughs> um basically the text that you are going to put alongside the post of the actual piece of content is what i call copy and what i'm referring to when i say writing copy um so for this um i do have like i guess something of a strategy behind what i write to go along with posts um so i know that on most platforms people are going to see the first one or two lines of text and then the rest they're going to have to click into or tap into what have you to see more so i recommend putting your most important pieces of information up front at the beginning of the video um, not the video the beginning of the copy um, because that's what they're gonna see first um, and then you can put additional information below so for me I had like an extra like a little short description of my book that I did so basically just saying tender beast is a why psychological thriller um, this is kind of roughly what it's about it's got these sorts of vibes um, go to the link in my bio to pre-order and because I was doing a pre-order campaign I was like you can get like these really cool goodies and be entered into this prize pack if you pre-order at the link in my bio and I just created a short little snippet of text for that and I added that essentially to almost all of my posts. Um, so if someone was like, oh, that's kind of like an interesting piece of content, let me like see more of the copy, then right in that same post they can see this is what the book's about, oh, if I pre-order I can get something cool and that's it. Um, and I put this together, I put this in every post just because I find it's really helpful because a lot of people like, if they're following you, maybe they know you, maybe they already know about the book, but it's just helpful to have those things in place for people so that you kind of don't have to wonder. Um, so it's not just like, here's a cover of my book and here's the post and like, I'm so excited for my book coming out. And then the person's like, what is the book about? Um, because then you have to trust that they will be like, I'm gonna look it up and go on Goodreads or what have you and like see what the book is about. And for me, like the easiest you can make something for a person to not have to go anywhere um, is the best. Um, especially on social media, people are not naturally inclined to leave the platform they are on and to go somewhere else. And so there has to be a lot of incentive to push them to go somewhere else. Um, and so if you can just provide all that information right in one, um, I find it to be really helpful. So I basically just put that little snippet, I copied and pasted that to all of the copy I had in my content calendar so that I could just copy and paste it in. Um, so that was something that I added to my copy. Otherwise, whatever you put in it is whatever you feel. Um, yeah, it's really like personal. It's up to you <laughs> to decide what you want to put in there. Um, and the really that only thing I would add is that just kind of extra piece. Um, hashtags. Honestly, I don't know anymore. I don't know if they're helpful or not. I think a lot of social media platforms have kind of been upgrading their search a little bit where, you know, if you search for something, it'll pull in something even if there wasn't a hashtag, whereas before it used to be like you had to put in the hashtag or you were never going to be found on that sort of thing. I still use hashtags just because at this point it's truly habit. Um, so it's up to you whether you'd like to keep using them or not. Um, but I also put them in there in the copy. Something else that I also tend to write out when I am writing copy for the post is I will also write out the alt descriptions. So the alt description, this is for folks who are visually impaired. Um, it's just a description of whatever the piece of content is. Um, 
in Instagram for uh, photos, they have like a separate section. You have to click like the advanced tools option and then you can do alt text and then you can add it and it'll be linked to each photo. Um, for videos, it isn't really necessary the case, necessarily the case. Um, and so I will do alt descriptions for like videos that I've really, you know, planned out and done all of my work in for my content um, just because I want to and it's kind of a highlighted piece of content and so I like to do the alt text for it as well um, just to try and be a little bit more accessible so uh, that's up to you but I do think it is great if you can. Another big part to me of setting up the social media campaign for my books is the website setup. Uh, so essentially I want my website to help complement the content I'm putting out on social media. So for example if I'm telling people buy my book and you can go to the link in my bio to buy my book I want to have something on my website set up so that people can do that um, just so it makes it easier because in Instagram which I'm not sure that everybody knows because I still see some people do this you cannot put clickable links in Instagram um, and also people cannot highlight things in Instagram so if you put a link not only can people not click on it there is no way for them to highlight that text at least using an iPhone I don't know maybe it's different with other phones for them to highlight that text and like copy and paste it um, you would have to like take a picture and highlight the text. It's just as useless. It's completely useless to put a link in your Instagram description. It is helping no one. It is not not helpful at all. Um, and so I will usually that, do that, like go to the link in my bio and then you can click it easily. So if people really want to learn more information or do whatever, then they can kind of go to your link. And so for me, I set up something on my website for this. I know sometimes people use a website called Linktree, um, which can do links for you. There's a free version. There's also paid versions. I've used it in the past. I don't care for it. Um, so that's why I do it on my own website. Um, it just gives me more control and more flexibility and so I just have a page on my website which is called Linktree and I just put a bunch of links there um, so links to buy my books, links to pre-order my books, um, links to anything I posted about recently that I want to talk about. Sorry something is going on with my hair um, and I put that on that page um, and then it's all self-contained and I tell people to go there and so you have to have something set up in order to be able to do that and I do recommend setting up something just so that again you make it as easy as possible for people to go and search out your books. Um, I will also extend this a little bit more so um, I will create what's called a bit.ly link for all of my books. Um, so bit.ly is free, it's a website um, and it lets you create like a shortened link. Um, so on my website I have a page where I have all my tender beast information and I created a bit.ly called bit.ly slash tender beast um, and so that's a link that I can share. Um, I usually put it on like physical promo things, so on bookmarks, but I can also like, if I wanted to, I could share that link in a post um, because that is something that someone can confidently go and type in and search up and it not be that much work for them. The thing I will say, however, about the bit.ly link, which I don't think a lot of people realize this, the bit.ly link is case sensitive. So that means it matters whether or not you use capital letters. So if I did bit.ly slash capital T tender and capital B beasts, if people go and type that in and they don't do the capitals, it'll say page not found. So that's why when I do bit.ly links, I always do everything lowercase if it is a link that I am expecting people to have to like manually type into their phone what have you to go seek it out um, because a lot of people will not necessarily know that they have to do the capital letters. Um, so that's what I will say about Bitly because I see this happen a lot also with like professional publisher campaigns where they will do the capital letters and like if you're typing it and you don't know to do capitals um, it's not going to go anywhere. <laughs> so that's why I say and mention that but just kind of having something set up on your website as a touch point so that if people do want to learn more information they can go there. And of course you could be like go to X bookstore website or like search up whatever you want you can do that but it is just helpful to just have something direct like the easier you can make it for people to learn about your book or to buy or pre-order your book the better.
And now on to the final step of getting all of your content in place, which is the scheduling. Um, so you have two options for scheduling your content ahead of time. Um, so you can do this manually using the tools in the app, um, or you can do this um, using a paid program, um, something like Later, for example, which I have used in the past. Um, and so if you're doing it manually, you are using the in-app tools. So Instagram does allow you to schedule things roughly up to a month in advance. Um, so you can schedule your reels to post, you can schedule your kind of content, your regular post to post. Um, TikTok inside the platform I think if you go on the computer, like if you do it on the computer, you can schedule your TikToks, um, but there was also a time limit to it. I believe it was kind of like up to two weeks in advance. Um, so what I ended up doing manually for a lot of my posts is that on my phone, I have an iPhone, I use the reminder app and I just kind of put this post is going out today at this time and I set a reminder and then the reminder would come up and I would go and I would post it. Um, and this is because I had two months worth of content and so I couldn't schedule out everything. Um, and so something that really helped me for this that like saved me time with doing this manually is I went on Instagram, went on TikTok and I made drafts of all of those posts. So I went in, I took all the copy information from my content calendar, I copied it, I pasted it into Instagram, I set all my stuff on my tags and all of that thing up, um, and I created a draft of the post. Um, so on Instagram, you can look up how to create drafts, but essentially like you make it like you're making the post and then you go back um, and at some point it'll be like save the draft and then you save the draft. Um, and so ahead of time, I just uploaded everything and saved drafts of everything on both Instagram and on TikTok. And then I set all of those reminders in my phone. And so that is a way to do it manually. And if you do it manually, you can do it for free. Um, the paid version with something like Later is an option I have used in the past. So using Later, you can schedule posts you can schedule like multiple page posts like what are they not carousels are they called carousels anyway you can schedule <laughs> posts with multiple pictures um you can put your copy in there um you can also uh schedule instagram stories um it does have to like prompt you and you'll still have to like manually post them at least it was in the past maybe it can do it automatically now um but it couldn't before um and same with your reels and it can also schedule for tiktok and automatically post if you have a business account with tiktok and instagram so these are kind of like reliant on you having business accounts not personal accounts um on tiktok i have a a creator account I believe um, and I'm not sure if that also counts so you'd have to check the details on later um, but it's essentially it will let you schedule however far out in advance you want to um, there are limits I think it's like a hundred posts per month or something like that um, on the first tier of later of how much you can schedule um, and then you can put everything in there and have everything kind of go out automatically or that program will build in prompts for you. Um, so that's a second option. Um, I have used Later in the past. Why I don't use Later anymore is because it's gotten more expensive <laughs> and it's in USD and I'm a Canadian and so it becomes even more expensive than that. And then especially if I'm doing something over two months, then I have to pay for it for two months. So then that also kind of exploded the cost. And I just didn't want to do it. Um, to me, it wasn't really that much extra work to just manually schedule everything. And so that's why I did it that way. But you might want to do that option. So that's just why I bring it up so that you kind of know that you have multiple options going in for how you can do this. Um, but I found that the draft format really was helpful for me um, and so I did it that way. I highly recommend scheduling this all before whether you do that manually or through a paid service. It will really just make your life easier to have all of those things ready to go and you can just kind of feed them out according to your content calendar in that way. Um, especially because I find in traditional publishing usually when you are setting up to launch your book so not only are you doing all of the work involved in 
and launching the book. Um, often if you have a second book in your contract, you're also doing the edits of that book very close to the launch of the book. This just ends up being the way that publishing timelines always align for some terrible reason. Um, but that's the way it usually ends up going. And so it can be potentially a very busy time. And if you have all of that, all of that scheduled ahead of time, it's just one less thing off your plate to worry about. And so that's why I really recommend scheduling ahead of time. Now getting into analytics. So how do you measure performance? How do you measure if your campaign worked? Um, so this is really going to be dependent on your goals going into this. For me personally, um, and for, in my opinion, for traditionally published authors, I do not think planning a social media campaign and going into it with the goal of selling books is helpful. Um, and I say that because it is very difficult to ladder to basically be able to tell that what you posted led to book sales. It is very hard to measure that. Um, especially because some authors in traditional publishing don't even have access to a sales portal. And so then you're only kind of sales data that you're going to get is going to come when you get your royalty statement, which happens twice a year. And it's very delayed. It's kind of like six months back from when something happened. Um, so it's going to be so hard to be able to tell that it has done anything. And so for me, my goal going into posting and doing these sorts of campaigns is just to kind of get people who are already existing within my readership um, excited about the new book that I have coming out um, because they're already tapped in, they're already following me, they're already a warm audience. I just want to get them pumped up about the book coming out um, and really be able to, in some ways, like, you know, excite them um, because readers recommending to other readers, getting other readers excited to me is uh, a higher value <laughs> and more likely to get people to pick up my book than me directly going to the reader. Um, and so it's kind of like trying to excite my current audience, create a little bit of a ripple effect. Um, that's kind of my goal going in. And I don't necessarily expect that to lead to sales. I pretty much is like excitement. And that's what I'm kind of measuring. Um, and so I measure that based on how the book, how the post does on social media. Um, and so that's kind of what I look at. Um, it's not really a hard and fast anyway, but it's a little bit closer to a measurable goal than like selling books because how can you how can you see that metric whereas you can see how well a social media post does or doesn't do that sort of thing um and i measure this based on kind of what my posts usually do how they usually perform so if i usually get 10 likes on a post and suddenly I get 30. Oh, wow, that did really well. Um, whereas I only get, you know, five or two. Okay, that one didn't do as well. And so that's basically how I am measuring, deciding whether a post like did well or didn't do so well. Um, and I basically just use this to decide whether or not I'm going to do that sort of content again in the future for future books. Because at this point, I've already planned out my campaign. I've put everything in place. If you are the sort of person where you want to like switch things around based on how things are doing, um, you do you, but that is not me. I've planned out all my content. I've scheduled it. It's going to go out. Um, and how it does is how it does. <laughs> and I will just learn things for the next time. Um, so that is really what I look at when I'm looking at analytics. Um, and I'm also measuring the effort that I put in personally. Um, so for example, I did my little cosplay videos. Um, so I did those um, and that's a lot of effort. Um, so I might also just like not do something later on because if I put in a lot of effort and it kind of just did okay on social media, uh, do I want to put in that much effort again just to have something do okay? Or would I rather invest in some other things that did a little bit better and were a little bit more low effort. Um, so these are the sorts of things that I look at when I'm looking at analytics. Um, and I'm going to get into things a little bit more specifically in a second. So how did my content perform? So here I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about the sort of posts that I made and how they did on my social media. Um, this might not necessarily reflect, like you might post something similar on your own social media and your followers might absolutely love it. 
so I wouldn't like listen to this and think oh this didn't do well for Lizelle so like I guess I shouldn't do that on my own platform absolutely not um, I really just share this with you um, so you can kind of get an idea of what this sort of planning phase or like analytic after phase looks like where I kind of look at my things and see how they did um, or you can also use this to decide what content you might want to invest in um, again just because something isn't doing well on my platform doesn't mean it wouldn't do well on your platform it's just kind of you know it varies um, but I think these sorts of things are interesting so that's why I'm sharing and talking about it um, and I'm gonna go based on the different platforms to begin with. Um, so starting with Instagram, the photo posts on Instagram. So I did um, photo posts where I took pictures of my book in kind of flat lay positions. Um, I did those sorts of photos and I did graphics. Um, so I did one, I did a little quiz that was a graphic um, and I did a gra another graphic about like song lyrics. Um, and then there were some different graphics that came in there. So one of the kind of ad hoc things that I didn't plan out in my campaign but I added in was I did get some trade reviews and so I posted little graphics of the trade reviews um, and then also the title page for my book um, like I talked about before for Tender Beast I took a screenshot of the title page and I shared that as well. So how did that content do? So I found that the photo posts where I actually took a picture uh, did really well. I thought those did great. People responded well to those. And so that's something that I'm like, cool, I'll do that again in the future. But I found that the graphics, the quiz and the song lyric thing, very, very under like performed under <laughs> underperformed in a significant way, um, which I found them fun and I like them. And I say this to as well to you if you like doing something even if it doesn't like perform on social media if you want to do it and you want to post it do it and post it you know like do your own thing if you want um but for me i was like okay those graphics like took a little bit of extra effort for me to do um and maybe next time i won't bother with them i'll spend more effort taking more pictures of my book in more different scenarios because that seemed to be what people liked a lot so maybe i'll do that a little bit more um some graphic did better though um so it wasn't like all my graphic posts didn't do well like the title page that did really well and also some of my trade review graphics, which I found interesting, but I think I understand what it is. So I got some trade reviews for Tender Beast and some of them were really enthusiastic and excited. And some of them were kind of like a little bit more middle of the road, but I was like, ah, I don't know, I got a review, I guess I'll just post it. Um, and I do find that the more enthusiastic <laughs> review did better than the like, uh, sort of review and so I think you know maybe in the future I'll kind of make kind of decisions about which ones I feel like are worth posting about um and which I'll kind of just like let them rock and let them be their own thing um I think I got very in my head and for some reason I thought if I didn't post someone's trade review that they'd like get mad and like never review the book again um but I don't think anyone is paying that much attention so um yeah that's something that was kind of a learning so it wasn't like every graphic did bad but it, I do feel like I had to think more thoughtfully about which things I should make graphics for and post and like which maybe I shouldn't um so that was the Instagram photos so Instagram video content um so I did a bunch of reels these are the same pieces of content that I posted on TikTok but TikTok had different results so that's why I'm going to talk about it separately um but this is about Instagram real post um so I did some videos where I cosplayed as my main character from Tender Beast Sunny um so I had two types of these videos so I had cosplay videos where I wrote up a little script and it was basically to kind of like you know say something succinct about the book um in the character's voice and then there were a separate cosplay videos in which I was saying direct quotes from the book and so to me this was like a way to switch up doing you know quote graphics which I'd done in the past and kind of think perform so so and so I thought what if I did the quote in a different way like coming right from the mouth of the character so that's what that was um I also had a video that was like an aesthetic sort of slideshow of photos um I had one of those videos um and I also had videos where it was like my regular self 
um, showing up in the video. So I introduced a trailer. Um, so I did a little trailer video for my book. Um, and then I also had um, a video where I explained in detail the pre-order campaign um, for Tender Beasts. Uh, and so that was another one as well. And then I had a video that I did a reminder for the pre-order campaign. So those were the sorts of videos that I was posting on the platform. So the cosplay videos, it's very interesting. So I found that with the very first cosplay video I did, that did very, very well. Um, and then one I did later also did well. And these were both the ones where I'd written a little script that was like, uh, shared some things about the book in the character's voice. Um, but I found that the quote videos kind of just did all right. Um, which like for the amount of effort I put in because I had to memorize <laughs> word for word quotes and then spit them out to the camera and I'm not a good memorizer at all at all my memory is terrible so that was really hard for me to do um so to me I was like okay I'll probably just not do the quote one in the future um which is so interesting because I think you always think people want to like see quotes from the book but I find that like when I post quotes from the book on social media it's kind of like mixed or kind of medium results but I find that things do better if it's more like I'm sharing a succinct amount of information about what the book is about. Um, and I don't mean necessarily like the tropification of books where I'm just throwing out tropes, but I mean like really just like talking about what the book is about or like giving people a short idea. Um, so like there's a video where I cosplayed as Sunny um, giving an endorsement of Tender Beasts. Um, and she talked about like how what people say about her family. And so it wasn't like I was like, this is what the book is about. Um, but she talked about her family and it kind of gave you an idea of that character. So it was interesting. I found that the difference between the quotes and like those sort of like scripted in character voice videos. Um, I also found the aesthetic, like the slideshow aesthetic video, I found that did well as well. Also, I thought the video where I was explaining the whole pre-order campaign, I thought that would be really boring to people, but I wanted to do it so that I could have a complete kind of like, this is everything that's happening in the pre-order campaign in a video format since I know people are more inclined to listen to a video than they are to read a wall of text. Um, so I was just putting it out there just to be like, okay, well, it's here in case anybody need it, needs it. And I was surprised that like people responded well to it because it was also a longer video too. So that was interesting um, to me. So that was kind of how the videos did. Oh, the trailer also did well. So that was how they did on Instagram. So kind of what I took away from that is that I don't know that I'm gonna be doing like quote content so much in the future um, as opposed to things that more give like a short snappy idea of the content of the book. Now for the TikTok video results. So again, I posted the same videos on TikTok that I posted on Instagram with the exception of I also posted on TikTok my animated cover, um, whereas my animated cover on Instagram, I just posted in my Instagram stories. Um, and I had like a separate photo post for Instagram, but on TikTok, I just posted it as the video. Um, and so how the videos did. So my cosplay videos, um, all except for the very first one that was the introductory one, significantly underperformed my other videos on TikTok. And even the introductory cosplay video only did kind of slightly better than normal on TikTok. Um, I found that what did the best on there was the book trailer video that I did. Um, uh, they also the animated cover did surprisingly well and what did like very strangely the best was that long pre-order explanation video that I thought would be so boring. Um, that was what did really well on TikTok which I think is so interesting <laughs> um, and I do it makes me kind of wonder if it's because it was a longer format post if maybe TikTok is trying to push longer format things on the platform um, or if it was just because it was me speaking in my regular voice um, maybe that was it I find it very interesting um, 
And previously, like, I actually didn't expect the animated cover to make any sort of impact because previously when I posted my animated covers on TikTok, it didn't really do well. But I posted them anyway because my publisher made them for me and I think they're cool. So I posted them anyway. Um, and then this one, for whatever reason, um, did get to people. But um, the best performing content um, was definitely the book trailer and that pre-order video um, and that little aesthetic slideshow video just kind of did okay. Um, so it was very interesting um, that it was so different from Instagram. But I think to me, this is my little like theory. Um, my theory is that on Instagram, because I started it as I was kind of coming up as an author, a lot of the people who follow me on Instagram are other authors. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of readers too and like, um, you know, people who are like book influencer people. Um, but I feel like it's also like a good chunk of authors. And I think more authors follow me on that platform than do on TikTok, because I feel like TikTok, I tried really hard to make kind of reader first. Um, whereas like Instagram, like I used to do like little reels of like how I got my agent and things like that. And so I think I cultivated a little bit of a different audience. And so I think on Instagram, when I posted the cosplay videos, people could tell it was me. And so then it was like, oh, look, Lizelle's like dressing up and like doing something <laughs> cosplay. Like, oh, that's like really cute. So I think that's why it did so much better on Instagram because people could tell it was me and they were like, hey, that's something different new. Um, so I think that's why it had that impact there. Whereas on TikTok, I feel like people were like, I don't know who that lady is. And so it was just kind of like base level. Um, and so I think that's what made the difference. But then when I was just saying quotes, I like, because I was having to memorize, I was a little bit more monotone because I had to memorize things, um, as opposed to when I was just saying something quippy about the book. So yeah, it's very sort of interesting results. Um, that are perhaps a little bit like, I really don't know what to make of the TikTok stuff. I think I'll probably just continue just doing, I'll probably go more based on the Instagram data and just make those things and I'll post to both platforms, but like before, um, but it was interesting to see the differences between the platforms. Um, but I think really what I kind of took away from it is that I probably will chain, not really do so many graphic posts. Um, I think I'll rely a lot more on photo posts for Instagram. Um, and I think the quote thing I will we'll move away from because I don't think that's been helpful for me. And I've noticed that from other years as well. And so I think to me going forward with more short kind of ways of sharing different aspects of the book, um, in a more kind of, I suppose, scripted way versus like sharing an exact quote, I think will kind of be the move for me. But hopefully that was helpful to like hear about and see how different things did. And just some final thoughts before we close off this video. I do want to reiterate that you do not have to do all this stuff as a traditionally published author. You really don't. I do all of this stuff because I used to work in social media and so a lot of it is just kind of, um, I guess it like feels natural to me and I also enjoy doing it. Um, and I don't do it often. That's why I organized this into a campaign because for that this bubble of time, I do a lot of promotion and then you'll see I very rapidly drop off. I'll like disappear <laughs> for like weeks after. Um, and so I do it in a very concentrated burst um, and I put it out and then from there I just post extremely haphazardly. And so that's also why I'm like on board with just kind of doing this campaign because it is not something that I'm trying to keep up long term at all. I am basically focusing in for the time that leads up to my launch and kind of that week after the book is out. And after that, I'm like chilling and just doing my own thing. So that is kind of for me how I manage doing that as well. But again, you do not do this. I firmly believe that is your public in traditional publishing, it is your publisher's job to market, promote and sell the book. Um, and that is your job as the author to write the book and to maybe update your audience. If you have social media, you like social media to update your audience on the things that you want to update your audience about and that you want to share with your audience. To me, that's how I think that is. But 
I know traditional publishing is nowhere near perfect and so I know that sometimes for authors like putting these things together or like putting a promotion plan together um, can make you feel like you have some sort of control over the process. I think it is a very clever trick um, to make authors think that they can have this significant impact on their book sales when often they will not. Um, certainly some people go viral, they have a huge impact on their book sales and it's awesome and it's great, but most people will not go viral. The amount of people going viral is very small in comparison to the whole of the traditional publishing um, amount of authors that are out there existing um, and so I hope that you as an author will not put any pressure on yourself to like my efforts and my promotion must sell books um, because I think that is a lot to put on yourself. It is also near, very very difficult for you to measure how your efforts are performing in any sort of direct sort of way. Um, I think really like for me, for my goals and what I think social media does is it is a way for me to like help push some excitement in an audience that is already warm to being exciting, excited about my books because that's why they're following me. They're interested in me and my stuff and my books. Um, and so if I can post things that like help them get more excited um, and you know, maybe they'll go out and they were probably already planning to buy the book or borrow it from their library or whatever have you but maybe if I can post a little bit more I can get them a little bit more excited they can do that a little bit more quickly a little bit faster um, because for publisher those like big kind of first week sales those are the biggest your sales are going to get usually um, and so if you can kind of like get people <laughs> to do that a little bit faster um, that's great but really it's like to me it's very much just a touch point um, I am not going to be selling books. Maybe every once in a while someone sees a post from me and that is the reason they bought the book, but often that will not be. <laughs> it will often be that there have been, you know, five plus touch points that have made them decide to buy this book. So they saw my post, they saw a post from my publisher. Um, the publisher was able to get the sales people excited and they pushed my book at location. So somebody went into the bookstore and they saw my book on a nice table spread. Um, some other bookstore posted about it. They saw a great Goodreads review, um, what have you. There are going to be a few different touch points before someone decides, yeah, okay, I'm gonna pay $20 USD to buy this thing or 24, 25. Canadian to buy this thing um, and so to me that's what I am that's what me and my content is is another touch point um, and just like a, just one part of that puzzle um, I don't rely on myself or my social media or anything I do to be the reason that people purchase the book um, because it's not my job my job is to write the book and I did it and I was already done everything I needed to do so I just I always want to say that with like social media and traditional publishing because I feel like there is a lot of push and a lot of pressure on authors um, and I feel like so much of that is like when you have no control, when you feel like your publisher has dropped the ball and they're not doing anything, it feels like, okay, now I'm the only person, like it's on me because I am the most excited about my book to try and get people out there and to do it. Um, and I just find that that's like a lot to put on yourself. So I caveat this whole thing with like to really do this if you want to do it and you enjoy it and you think it'll be good for you and it won't be detrimental in the long run. Um, that's what I would say about doing these sorts of like campaigns or social media or promotional push. Um, if you're going to do it like planning everything out or that sort of thing or put any pressure on yourself to execute in a certain way. So hopefully that made sense and wasn't too rambly. Um, but I always think that in traditional publishing, social media should be something that an author is doing because they want to um, or just to connect to your audience a little bit more um, as opposed to pressuring yourself to sell books um, when that is something that the publisher is meant to be doing. So 
really like what you do should be complementary to what your publisher is doing in the ideal scenario. Um, but that's it. I hope this video was helpful in kind of giving you a little bit more of an idea in detail of kind of what I do to plan out um, promotional campaigns for my books. Um, as I said, I would, I'm hoping in the future to do some kind of like detailed creation things. So um, I planning already to do a video about like how to make your own book trailer um, and to kind of go through specific step by steps of how I do that. Um, and if there's anything else that you'd like to see specifically in the future, you can comment down below and let me know or if you have any questions for me or anything like that. Um, and yeah, I think that's everything. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, please subscribe. And thank you so much for watching. Bye!